on Beam. I've been working on Beam for about, um, I guess, three and a half years now. I've been working on Beam since it was uh, donated to um, the Apache Software Foundation by Google. Um, and I am a software engineer at Google. I'm uh, Alan. I'm not a committer on Beam, but I have been working on Beam for, for a little while. Um, I'm a test engineer at Google, and I've uh, been working at Google for about eight years now. So, um, a disclaimer, you know, these are our opinions, not Google's. We, we don't speak for our employer, we just speak for ourselves and uh, our experiences working on, um, on Beam. So, um, to start off... Um, okay, the remote <coughs> no longer works. That's a bummer. Um, oh, no, we just have lost the ability to advance. Okay. That's fine. Hey, there we go. Hey, um, cool. So to start, let's let's uh, let's talk about what makes a community a friendly place to be. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I came up with some things. You know, easy communication, uh, productive engineering. Um, we all, you know, believe in the Apache way, since we're here at ApacheCon. Uh, you know, clear onboarding process, reliable infrastructure, um, and you know, a whole host of other things. Uh, does anyone have anything else that, you know, they think makes a community friendly? Just shout it out. Snacks. Snacks? <laughs> snacks. <laughs> friendly communities through snacks. You know, let's quit our jobs and just uh, deliver snacks to people. Um, perfect. Perfect. Um, and so specifically, um, Alan and I are going to talk some about what infrastructure helps make a community friendly. What does it mean for a community to be friendly from an infrastructure perspective. Um, you know, what does it mean to have happy developers? And, um, you know, what things can we do to make that happen? So, you know, off the top of my head, I came up with continuous integration. Uh, Jira. Um, I guess, you know, Jira doesn't make people happy. Um, <laughs> issue, issue tracking systems generally um, help. Uh, website, you know, the build system metrics, um, and all, so all of these systems and more sort of come together to um, create the, the ecosystem of tools and processes that enable a community to sort of uh, work on a project together and, uh, and make progress. So, um, just some, you know, very brief statistics. Uh, Beam has had over its lifetime, I think, yeah, more than 500 people who've worked on it, we have generally about 100 plus unique authors per release. Uh, we run at a six week release cadence. I heard someone saying that there were you know, a couple thousand commits per release. So we're, you know, Beam is operating at a, you know, a reasonable scale, um, merging a couple of pull requests a day and, um, and sort of you know, operating as a fairly mature and uh, productive engineering project. So um, to that you know, helps scope out the project a little bit. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about engineering productivity. Cool. Um, so, uh, Jason and I work together, and every day we walk and we figure out, hey, what things should I work on today? Um, and there are some guiding principles around what we are deciding to focus on and some pillars on what we're doing. So, I'm going to like, give you a little bit of background about what is engineering productivity, what does it mean? So engineering productivity at Google is an engineering discipline. Um, you can get careers and, and stuff like that. Uh, there are different job ladders within there. And so years ago, there was software engineer and test. And people didn't really like the, the word test in their title. And it was more than test that they were doing. So that became software engineer in tools and infrastructure. Jason used to be one of those. And that ladder is gone now, too. So there's a, a software engineer. And so we have software engineers, and we sometimes call them sweeps, software engineer in engineering productivity to differentiate, but it's the same job family within Google as software engineer, same hiring bar, same evaluation criteria. Um, there are other job ladders within engineering productivity. There's a release engineer. They focus a lot on releasing. Um, there's a test engineer, and both release engineers and test engineers, um, coding is part of the requirement. So you do need to know how to do software engineering, um, but you also bring in more domain-specific skills in those areas. Um, but there's also been an evolution of engineering productivity at Google. 
um, over the last few years, like maybe five or six years. Um, and it, it's a from test engineering to engineering productivity. So Google was really proud on their focus on test automation, and that test automation was a difficult thing to do. Um, now we feel it's not that difficult a thing to do. A lot of people are doing test automation, but I get, you know, test automation as a preference to manual testing, automating your releases. Um, there used to be a conference called the Google Test Automation Conference that ran from 2006 to 2016. One of the reasons we don't do a Google Test Automation Conference is the focus is no longer just on test automation. It's on engineering productivity. Um, uh, there used to be a, a program when I started at Google called Test Certified, which was uh, how do we figure out how mature a, a organization is in terms of their testing and test automation. Um, that's now Project Health. We, we look at all sorts of things about the, the release cycle. Um, and so there has been the shift. But these are the things that we work on. This is the things that you know Jason and I usually pick to work on. It's not just the release and test stuff, but like how are the developers happy productive and friction free in the work that they do. And Jason's going to talk about some of the pillars of engineering productivity. Thanks, Alan. So um, at Google, the, the way that we think about engineering productivity is sort of within these couple of pillars in terms of what, you know, what are the categories of work that make engineers productive. So um, we have you know, test health, and uh, in this talk I've included build health in, uh, in that as well. So build and test health. Um, we've got release process. Um, so you know, how, how are you automating your releases? How are you making it easy for your project to get a release out the door? Um, what things are you doing to, to streamline that process? Um, and then we have metrics and performance. You know, metrics, we want to be able to measure the work that we're doing. We want to be able to understand when things are good. We want to be able to understand when things are not going as well. Um, and we want to be able to understand if we are working to improve you know, any of these various categories, um, what, are the, you know, what are the numbers right now? Where do we want the, what direction do we want the numbers to go in? And how do we think the work that we're doing will affect those numbers? You know, being able to data drive the work that you're doing and understand how it will affect uh, the ecosystem is something that's really, really important. Um, and then, you know, we've got, we've got performance testing as well. And performance testing winds up being a little bit of the, you know, unloved child, but, um, but is, is something that uh, we at Google and, and sort of we as Beam as well are, are focusing on more and more and more. You know, as a project matures, as there are fewer, you know, low-hanging fruit in the, in the, the other three areas, that it winds up being more and more important to focus on, or, you know, more and more impactful to focus on performance. Perform, you know, the way that performance winds up sort of being is that if you, you know, if your project doesn't build, it doesn't matter what the performance of it is, you know, it, it doesn't build. If your tests don't pass, it doesn't matter what the performance of your project is, your tests don't pass. Um, and so performance, just sort of as, as the nature of the thing, winds up coming sort of down the line of, uh, of the work that you wind up doing, but that doesn't make it any less important. It's just sort of one of the things that you come to later in the, in the maturity of a project. Um, so I'm going to dig a little bit, or Alan and I are going to dig a little bit into each of these pillars and how we've done some work in the Beam community to, um, to sort of take action and move the community forward in these areas. So I'm going, to t I'm going to talk first about build and test health. Um, and you know, any uh, conversation about build and test health in the open source world winds up talking about a good friend, Jenkins. Um, or as you know, we, we know our good friend Jenkins, a little <laughs> bit more like this. Um, and I want to give a huge shout out briefly to the infra team. Um, I don't know if any of them are, are here. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't see anyone. Um, but huge shout out to the infra team who make working with Jenkins manageable. Like you know, they they put in a, a huge amount of work to make Jenkins a little bit you know a little bit more like this and a little bit less like like this. Um, but you know it's it's still in in the nature of the beast for Jenkins to be to have some some struggles and those struggles generally come in. As, as I've found, three categories. There's configuration, there is consistency, 
and there is uh, comprehension. Um, and Robert, you know, I, I originally had consistent configuration consistency and like understandability, and Robert was like, no, you need three C's. You know, if you, if you got the first two, you need the third one. So, so comprehension. Um, and so let's dig a little bit into each of these, you know, configuration consistency and comprehension in terms of what the problems are and what solutions we've applied to those problems. Um, so first, configuration. Um, Jenkins' configuration is, you know, not, is difficult. And there's a thousand different knobs and a thousand different switches. And, and for, you know, when you come to Jenkins first, you generally go to the UI and you start clicking around in the UI and, and just sort of configuring your builds manually via the Jenkins UI. Um, and in the, in the ASF's Jenkins, that's not as easy a task because there's, um, you know, not everyone has access to Jenkins. Um, and Jenkins doesn't have fine-grained access control. You basically, like, have a ton of access or no access. Um, and for me, when I started, I wasn't a committer initially, and so either I had to go over to one of my friends who was a committer and say, hey, can you push these buttons in Jenkins? Or, you know, just sort of, like, sit there and manually do, do the things on my computer. So, um, you know, the configuration options are unclear. The change process is opaque. And, and, you know, if you make a change, it's hard to, you know, you might not remember what change you made. There's no auditability of the change process. You don't know, you know, what's changed, when did it change, um, and how do we roll back to a previous good state. So, um, for any of you who've worked uh, more with Jenkins, you will probably know the solution that we applied which is the Jenkins job DSL. And it's essentially a domain-specific language written in Groovy, which is, a, I think, a JVM language under the hood. But um, Groovy essentially allows you to programmatically configure your Jenkins builds. Um, it all winds up um, reducing down to XML, which is what Jenkins, how Jenkins understands its configuration in the back end. But it lets you um, essentially apply, you know, it lets you do config as code, um, which is way easier and, you know, applies the sort of source control principles. You know, you can, you don't need to be a committer on the project in order to go and change a Jenkins setting that you know needs to be changed. You can open a PR for the job configuration, uh, get it reviewed by a committer and get it merged, and then we have a, a seed job which periodically looks at the code base, looks at all of the Groovy files that we have, and um, makes it so that, uh, and sort of updates all of the Jenkins jobs as a result. Um, and, and this works really well for us. And we have, you know, you can see here uh, common job properties and common test properties. You know, we want all of our jobs to look a certain way. We want them to be configured with a certain set of settings. You know, how long do we want to keep the builds? How, um, you know, what's, what's the default timeout, et cetera, et cetera. And so these, this helps us also apply a, a good level of consistency to our builds and makes it really easy for people to add new builds. So, um, the, the DSL also has pretty good documentation. Um, the, you know, no documentation is perfect, but the DSL documentation is pretty good in terms of enumerating what the various configuration options are, what they change, um, and what other pieces of the uh, DSL they interoperate with. So, um, you know, clearer change process and configuration as code. Um, and this sort of, this has changed the way that we do Jenkins. It, it, it's much easier, it's much faster, and we're, we're much more happy with it. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about consistency. Um, in consistency, we, we identified a couple of problems, which were uh, job scheduling. Um, so how, how do you make it so that if you open a PR, um, your jobs uh, the, the jobs that you that get started as a result of opening that PR, you know, start in a reasonable amount of time and finish in a reasonable amount of time. Um, build flakiness, uh, that was originally why I had the croissant on that slide, you know, for, the, for consistency, yeah, flakiness. Um, and then uh, timeouts, everyone's favorite. Um, so to start, for job scheduling, um, and this is where, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cop out a little bit. Um, we, we work at Google, um, and, and Google has a sort of an incentive to um, do a lot of testing and get a lot of stuff uh, moving in that regard. And so we, we were able to convince our bosses, hey, look, we should donate some machines to the Apache Jenkins 
for you know dedicated build nodes for our project. Um, and we and so we we worked with the info team to donate a set of nodes for Beam, which are uh, you know which run our builds. And um, and so that that was a good start. Um, we also have sort of instituted reasonably aggressive timeouts, um, and this is something that I'll that I'll get to in a little bit, as I as I mentioned timeouts. Um, but the the you know consistent and reasonably uh, short-ish timeouts mean that you're never going to have a build which is you know taking an entire like taking up a, an executor slot for an entire day. Um, or taking it, taking something up for for a huge amount of time. Um, if there are build timeouts, they you know get noticed and get addressed. Um, and then you know the the final change that we made was we went to a set uh, we went from a set of sort of less um, like smaller VMs. We initially spun up a set of smaller VMs, but we were seeing a lot of out of memory issues and other sort of CPU related issues. So we uh, we beefed up our machines. Um, and so this was. This was a decision that was easy-ish for us. Might be might be difficult depending on where you are, but um, the the trade-off I think is pretty powerful. Um, if you can save engineer time by you know paying some more money up front for bigger machines, that will probably save you money because we spent hours and hours and hours dealing with, you know, oh, this build timed out, oh, this build ran out of memory, oh, this machine died, oh, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, the amount of time that we spent dealing with those issues um, was outsized to the amount of additional money that we pay the cloud provider for larger machines. So this, this had a really, really big impact um, on our ability to sort of uh, work effectively with Jenkins. Uh, in terms of build flakiness, uh, we ran into a couple of issues. Um, one of the issues was um, that when we, so we, we, a couple of years ago changed our build system from Maven to Gradle. And there were a couple of reasons for that. But one of the reasons for that was we were seeing a lot of network related flakes when we would start a build and Maven would start downloading a bunch of packages from Maven Central and then the network, the network would barf on one of them and the build would fail. Um, there's no retries. There's a lot of, you know, there's, I, I posted on Maven users. I, I worked to, to the extent that I could with the Maven community to figure this out, and we couldn't figure it out. And, um, and Gradle has retries. Um, and so this was a big win for us in terms of build consistency because if the network barfed on downloading one of the dependencies, it was okay. Um, we were able to, to deal with it. And, you know, we, we could have added job-level retries so that, you know, if the entire job failed, we just restarted it um, but that you know that has its own sort of set of problems, and so this was this was a pretty. Um, we also we also did a, a little bit better of a job of caching our you know M2 repository, um, so that that helped us as well. Um, and then the other thing that we did um, when we started having more problems with build flakiness, um, we our machines used to be managed by the Infra team. Um, so Infra was responsible for you know we provided the machines, but Infra was responsible for making sure the machines stayed happy. They had puppets set up on the machines to sort of uh, have consistent configuration across all of their build nodes, and um, and this and we started causing them a lot of problems because we were there was a period of time where the machines were going down just like every other day, like we were having two or three machines offline at any given time, and we were sort of on the uh, infra hip chat at that point, um, trying to figure out with them what was going on. Um, and at this point, they were starting to pilot a new program where they were handing back control of the build nodes to a particular project to manage that themselves. So we took advantage of that. It's a, just a JNLP jar that you run on the machine with a secret that then connects to Jenkins, um, and then you have control of your machine yourself. And so this was really big for us because then instead of having to go through infra to get access to the machines and to, to figure out what was going on, we could just SSH into them ourselves. And it turned out that there was a Python pre-commit which was um, running out of memory and just uh, completely killing the machines because it was overrunning its bounds. Um, we were able to you know, file a JIRA ticket and get that fixed. So that really helped from the build flakiness perspective. Um, and timeouts. So you know, I, I mentioned relatively aggressive timeouts as a way to solve um, the job scheduling woes, but then you know, everyone knows the pain of you know, you're sitting, 
you open a PR and you've run the, the pre-commits and you're waiting for them to finish and they're getting closer to the timeout. They're getting closer to the timeout. And then they time out. And then you do this. Um, I searched angry at computer. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so timeouts really are difficult. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things that we did to help with timeouts as well. Um, we did some build module refactoring. We, you know, we had a couple of larger packages, and we broke some of them up into smaller packages. Um, the Maven to Gradle transition, again, helped here because Gradle has a better incremental build um, optimization mechanism, and so this saved us up to three times of the, or, you know, greater than three times build speed up in some cases. Um, and then... Um, we also split a bunch of our Jenkins builds. Since we had some extra executor slots, since we had some extra nodes, we you know, took on the duplicated work in some cases of you know, doing an initial build um, and split up so that you know, we had the, the faster build in one build and we ran a lot of the heavier integration tests in one and we have you know, the rat check and the spotless check. You know, we, we have all of these different Sweet. So we're not just running one build to determine whether everything is good. We run everything um, slightly more individually and, uh, and parallelize in that way um, at the cost of additional uh, executor slots. But since things are a little bit faster and a little bit more consistent, we actually, I, I, I don't know that we, we saw a substantial decrease in, you know, our, or increase in our job scheduling time because we were just having some more, you know, pretty consistent builds running through and a lot of the smaller ones running through. So that's, and everyone benefits from faster results. Like this is one of the big things from a friendliness standpoint. You know, you open a pull request and a bunch of stuff starts failing. You don't know why it's starting to fail and you dig, you dig into the logs and you can't understand what's going on. Um, if we have smaller checks, which, you know, provide a clear pass or fail signal, you know, if the spotless check fails, then you know that you have like some, you know, code consistency issues. Uh, if the rat check fails, you know you've screwed up a license. Um, and, and that makes, makes all of that easier. So, um, to talk about comprehension. Uh, there's a couple of things to note here. Uh, build logs, failure investigation, um, and uh, current build status that we worked on. So, build logs, um, this is again, you know, I, I, I don't want to turn this into like a, a shouting the praises of Gradle talk, but this is another place where Gradle um, really helped us because Gradle has a concept called build scans, where essentially what they do is um, when the Gradle build finishes, it will upload the results of the build to the Gradle website. And the Gradle website will break it up into a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, it, it'll pull all of the metadata out, it'll pull the log out, it'll pull, you know, the failure cause out. And so instead of, you know, clicking on the button in Jenkins where it says your log is two megabytes or uh, three megabytes in size, and then you're you know, scrolling through it, uh, this provides a much faster way to just click on something and be like, okay, what broke? Um, what are the different pieces of metadata about this build? Uh, how does this work? So, uh, this also helps with failure investigation. Um, and additionally, like, failure investigation is one area where I think we have some additional work to do, because, you know, we've got the build scans, and now we can SSH into the machines, so if you're having a memory issue, or if you're having a CPU issue, you can log on to the machine and figure out what's going on. Um, but there's still, there's still a ton of work to do here. Um, and the last area is just the current build status. So this way, this is in the pull request template. Um, and uh, Michael uh, was, I think, responsible for adding this section. But when you open a pull request, um, in the pull request template is a whole section which has all of the various um, statuses of the builds at head in Jenkins. And so you can essentially see, okay, is, you know, if my pre-commits fail, are there prior issues? Like, it, is this going to be my fault, or is there something already going on at head which is um, causing, causing these problems? So this, you know, it's a sort of clearer, at-a-glance view of what's the current status of the build. So we found that that helps. Um... So yeah, uh, configuration, consistency, and comprehension were the sort of the things that we found that, that helped from a test and build health perspective, and, and so that's, that's what we did. Um, there's some additional stuff that we, you know, one or two additional things we did. Um, as I mentioned, we moved some packages around. We've changed the way that we shade uh, things, you know, a, a million times to, to make people happier. Um, and, you know, I think the, the most recent one seems to be working, but... Um, 
but yeah, we're also, uh, since we're doing a Python 3 upgrade, we've done some work to run the Python 3 tests in parallel, which results in you know, faster test results. And um, you know, we've, we've factored, and this is a little factoring table, um, which Alan found. Um, we've you know, factored the, the Jenkins builds out um, and, and allowed, allowed that to sort of help people. So Alan will talk about release. Cool. Yeah, so uh, build and test health, that was one of our pillars. Um, we really care about the releases as well. Um, and so one of the problems about Beam was that the releases were not uh, when we thought they, they could be. Um, and we value having regular, repeatable, predictable release timing. And this is, I, I think, like really genius because one of the low-tech solutions that really worked. Um, create a calendar for when the release is supposed to be. And uh, it, so there was a debate at first in, in terms of, like, if we're going to do a release every six weeks, does that mean six weeks from when we finish the previous release? Does that mean I start talking about it on a certain day? And we've defined on the calendar that is the day you are cutting the release branch. And so the discussion of the release tends to happen a week or two before that, but there's a Google calendar now where you can determine here is when we're cutting the release branch. And we've been doing a good job of sticking to that calendar, uh, even in the cases where the releases overlap. So some of the releases have taken more than six weeks from when the release branch was cut, which means you're about to cut another release branch and you still have one in progress. Um, that's been, that's been uh, we're still making uh, good progress in terms of cutting the release branches when we expect them to be. Um, and then uh, release scripts. Uh, so in addition to uh, having a regular cadence for releases, we want the releases to be less toil for the poor release manager. And there still is a fair bit of work to be done. And some of this is things that you don't want to automate away. Um, looking at the Jira issues and deciding which ones of these should we really be uh, like pulling into the release as, as a, a, a cherry pick. Um, but there are some steps that we can automate. So there's validation steps, there's creation of the candidates. Um, some of these are a little bit more delicate in terms of how you have your machine set up, so we're trying to make these better. Um, uh, the next steps that we're doing with these release scripts are trying to make sure that we can resume. So you went uh, three quarters of the way through the release script, and then it told you that uh, you know, you know, Git wasn't in your path, and so it couldn't do one step. So instead of failing out there, like being able to um, be able to restart, and then also checking the prerequisites for the scripts before you need them. But these are all shell scripts. Yeah. And these are, it's worth noting, these are all under active development. Like I took the screenshot yesterday, I think. So, you know, there's every release that we cut, um, there are new upgrades that we find for the release scripts. There's new sort of friction points that we find. And so we are, we're constantly updating these to make the release manager's job easier. Um, the, the Beam website. Um, so uh, there's been some changes in terms of how the stuff has been automated and a change in terms of the philosophy. So there were two, uh, and still are two repos, there are, uh, sorry, repos, repos, um, repositories. There is the Beam repo and the Beam site repo. Um, the human generated documentation is now in the Beam repo. So you can have a pull request that affects both your code and the documentation for it. Um, the Beam site repo now only has the computer-generated documentation, so the PyDoc and the JavaDoc in there. And that gets updated by the release manager when we do releases. Um, and the other uh, piece of the automation that has been around for a while is uh, staging the website on uh, Google, Google uh, uh, Cloud Storage so you can take a preview of it and, and see what it looks like. So in the Jenkins result, there's a link to where you can look at your website and with the stage changes. And this happens on every pull request. Yeah. Like when you open a pull request that changes the website, it'll automatically run the staging job so you can, you can go look at what your website changes look like. Yeah. So not really a pillar in itself, but one of the things that we care about are, for all the pillars are metrics. Like we want to be able to measure stuff so that we can improve it. And uh, we just don't want uh, to like, have it go in the wrong direction, and we also don't want to be making changes based on uh, people's impressions when we could be measuring it. So there are certain measurements that have been put in place for Beam, um, some about code velocity, uh, the, the reliability, 
um, post uh, commit, so on, on the master branch. Uh, pre commit latency is what we care about. Um, if I have a pull request that's broken, I actually expect the test to fail, so we don't really care about test reliability and counting how many times things fail, but we do care about latency that you get quick results. Um, data freshness, that talks about like as we're pulling data in from Jira and Jenkins, like how fresh is that? And then um, uh, stability for the, the jobs that we feel are really critical, like how do we actually monitor those status. And a, a big thanks to Mikhail for this as well, in terms of putting this in and getting a uh, DNS name for this. So uh, HTTP, not HTTPS, uh, uh, metrics.beam.apache.org. Um, and it has this stuff. It's all based on Grafana. Um, so here's one of the uh, code velocity things. It has... Uh, uh, pull request activity, like how many open pull requests are, what's the oldest pull request that we have that's open. Um, for, if, if you put out a pull request, someone besides yourself should comment on it within a certain amount of time. So we actually expect in the community that within the first seven days of you opening a pull request and requesting someone uh, comment on it, someone should actually comment on it and look at it. Um, how many uh, reviews do you have per reviewer? So some of the reviewers get hotspotted, and they have you know 50 reviews, and other reviewers only have one or two. So you, we want to be able to balance that around. Um, test reliability. How often are the tests passing and failing? Um, so the colorful graph at the top is our weekly. Uh, how, how often are things passing? The bottom graph is per day, um, and we can also look at these in terms of like what's the most recent results. Well, what are the most builds that have been happening? Um, so we can detect trends in terms of the reliability. Um, this is one of my, uh, my new favorite uh, Grafana visualizations. Uh, sometimes you wonder, did the test just fail once because you know, the, the executor was having a bad day? Or is there something really consistently going on in terms of the test like consistently failing? So this uh, provides a view for each of them. Um, if everything's green, everything's good. If things go from uh, like one one failure, but everything else is green, maybe you can look into it. If things are failing on a fairly consistent basis, then you definitely want to be taking a look at it and figure out what's going on. Um, and then performance. Uh, do you want to talk about performance? Please? Yeah, sure. Um, so, as I, as I mentioned, performance is something that Beam, Beam has been working on. Um, and while it's, it's something that, that we... Um, you know, we, we haven't spent as much time on it. It's still something that we've, we've put a lot of time into. So we have a lot of, um, mostly, uh, so we, we have a various, so this is a little bit of an eye chart, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. But there's, there's a couple of various categories of tests that we have. We have core operation. Uh, you know, Beam, Beam has, you know, several core operations that it does. So we have uh, performance tests for those core operations. We have performance tests for our IOs. Um, so, you know, how fast can you read from a source? How fast can you write back out? Um, and then we have a couple of additional, you know, there's a, a suite called the Nextmark suite, um, which is a series of sort of well-understood data transformations. So we have some benchmarks around those as well. And, you know, we've got some graphs for those. And so this, this makes it so that we can understand, you know, what is the actual status of this over time? You know, has, has there been anything which has really improved the quality of this benchmark um, has there been something which you know tanked uh, performance here? So, um, and so this is I mean this is essentially what you need from a performance standpoint. Like you need the the benchmarks and you need some some way to visualize them. The one thing that we don't have a ton of right now and we are excited to have in the future is some alerting. So if a benchmark goes from you know. Uh, one, one second for something to 25 seconds for something, um, it'd be great to be able to alert on that. It would also be great to be able to run performance tests against a pull request and be able to understand, um, you know, run those in the same environment that the, uh, the continuous performance tests are running in and be able to compare your result to what the results of the overall performance tests are. So there is, you know, some future work in this space. But, but yeah, that's more or less what we've got on performance. Um, and then, you know, there's some stuff that didn't wind up in, uh, in any of the pillars, really, but is still stuff that has been um, really important for the community. Um, so, Alan, do you want to talk about the dependency check? Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, <clears throat> this week we could have put into the release cycle, but uh, one of the challenges with open source is that you take a dependency on a component, it, it had a certain version, and then at, after a while you realize that version's getting kind of old and you want to upgrade to the most recent version. Um, and there tends to be a, f a fair bit of friction in terms of like how long do you wait. So if I wait for you know three years and then I, I jump to the most recent version, there's probably been some breaking changes that I'm going to have to adapt to. And then the transitive dependencies can matter, especially depending on how you're, um, you're, you're doing your shading and stuff like that. If I use component A and then I use component B and they both use component C, um, you have a diamond dependency in there, and you want to make sure that you uh, can use the same version of, of the component C uh, in that case. And so we have this dependency check. It runs, I think, weekly. It shows uh, the highest priority uh, dependencies that we should be updating. It automatically logs Jira issues for it. It tells you uh, what the current ver what version is, what the latest version is, and when the release date was. And it uses some heuristics like if you change the major version number, that's probably something you should be upgrading to. Uh, if you change the minor version number, it can go a little bit longer in terms of upgrading. And then uh, contributor documentation. So there's um, that is another area that worked on. Um, I, I don't know which of the pillars it falls into, except maybe friendliness. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of the Beam project is that we welcome non-code commit contributions. And so uh, and they've been recognized also with people becoming uh, committers based on non-code contributions. And so that to me is really exciting. Uh, we make it very clear in the contribution guide that what kinds of contributions are, are cool things we do. Um, setting up the development environment, if you are going to be doing code contributions. Um, and then when we've been onboarding new contributors, like just hearing what their pain points were and trying to address that. So one of the first things you want to do is you find a Jira issue and then you want to assign it to yourself. Well, you don't have Jira permissions by default. Um, and then how do you get it? And so we, the easiest way we've figured is like um, send an email to the dev list. Well, I'm saying like here... Here, this is who I am, and I want to be able to uh, have Jira issues assigned to me, and this is my Jira username, uh, and then someone will add you. Um, but that, that has the side effect also of uh, you know us hearing about what their background is and, and what sort of things they care about, which I think is a very positive thing as well. Can I talk with you? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so there's still additional work to be done here. Um, we. We still have a lot of release toil, you know. As Alan said, sometimes the releases take six weeks and um, or or more, and that's ideally something that we would um, help to uh, alleviate. And there's, you know, there's a couple of different ways that uh, releases wind up taking that long. One of which is just, you know, there's there's some contentious issues on the uh, uh, blocking. Jira list, like, you know, people want to cherry pick fixes into this release because they know the next release, it's not going to be for another six weeks, um, and, you know, potentially even longer if that release gets held up. So, um, people can, you know, talk about, you know, people can wind up in conversations about, like, oh, we want to get this feature into this release, um, and those discussions can, can wind up taking time. But uh, validations can also wind up taking um, a fair amount of time, um, and there's, there's more that can be done to automate some of the validations that we're doing so that um, instead of having to have, I mean, you know, it's always good to have people going and running validations themselves, but you don't want to rely on manual testing as your, you know, first testing strategy. So to the extent that we are able to automate more of the sort of uh, matrix of tests that we, that we need to run for a release, um, that's work that will, ben that will uh, greatly benefit the community. And that's, that's stuff that we've already done some work on, you know, someone, uh, we, we had some people doing some work on automating testing of the quick starts, for example. So, you know, we've got a quick start on the website, and we want to make sure that that quick start actually functions correctly. So we actually added some continuous integration tests to ensure that the quick starts work. Like, we, we go and we look at the actual quick start guide um, and run the commands that are in the quick start to ensure that it, that it um, stays working. So there's a bunch of stuff like that that we've done, and there's a bunch additional that, that we can do. Um, you know, there are other, there are other things that, uh, that are potential future work. Um, how do you get build breakages resolved? Like, you know, how, whose job is it to care about build breakages? Ideally, you know, 
the community's job. But when it's you know, everybody's job, it winds up being nobody's job. And so it winds up being the job of whoever is blocked by it at a given time. And so you know, various communities have various different ways of handling something like this. Um, but this is something that, that we could you know, look into as the Beam community to determine if we can um, you know, find a, a little bit more um, standardized of a way to, to take care of this. Um, and you know some some other other stuff that we talked about. So like, can we automate uh, triage of tests? Um, and can we get you know alerts for performance regressions? Uh, and those are those are both sort of areas of future work that we that we'd like to invest in. And uh, hopefully you'll hear more about in the coming months and uh, and years. So uh, hopefully all of that you know comes together to make a community where onboarding is easy and you know we. We don't have infrastructure which is blocking people, and we don't have you know random random issues which are causing people pain. Um, because as things cause people additional pain, their incentive to start contributing to a new project which is causing them this pain, you know, decreases and decreases. And so, to the extent that you can reduce friction and increase the product, like the initial productivity of people as they join the community, um, that's you know that you'll you'll uh, make your community friendlier. You'll have more additional contrib- uh, contributors to your project, um, and the world will be a happy place. So, um, that's our talk. Any questions?